welcome everyone to the Cosmos SDK community call of our monthly call. We haven't had it for the past couple of months due to holidays, vacation, and just springtime starting. And so this is the first time, first call of the summer. And so let's get it on. I'll first start with a quick update on stuff that the Cosmos SDK team has been working on for the past couple of months. Uh, an update on the Olympus upgrade, and then we have a presentation from Huang Yi um, from the Kronos team about block STM. So starting out with the Cosmos SDK, and what have we been working on? Well, we've been working on this thing that we've been calling V2, and, we've been, and everyone, most everyone knows about it since we've been talking about it for so long. We're nearing completion. We do have a running chain with it. And what V2 is, is if you saw this amazing talk by Matt from the SDK team at Devmos on IBL V2, IBL V2 is, part, is one equation. And then we have uh, store V2, which John, had, which John has been leading, and that is a separation of state storage and state commitment. And then we have server V2, and the server V2 is taking base up this hodgepodge of code, splitting it into three different components, and those three components are hot swappable. And so you mm -hmm. can do different things um, with them, dependent on what your application needs. So it's not only limiting to the framework that we have today, it's a lot more freer. So in short, this is a rewrite of the core of the Cosmos SDK. We already have testing partners. So our testing partner is Bearchain and Osmosis. And so we are working with them to get them integrated. Um, the team over at Strangelove working on Gordian has already has integrated Gordian into Server V2. So it's already a second consensus algorithm. Um, we talked with uh, the Rollkit team about using it. And we talked with um, Polymer about, I think it's called Monomer. Um, which is the OP stack on top of um, the oh, sorry the Cosmos SDK on top of the OP stack sequencer, and so all those all those components will be using Server V2 and the composability of that code. Past that, we've been working on a lot of simulations. So simulations, simulations, simulations. Uh, everyone knows that, or if you don't know, we do have a simulator in the Cosmos SDK. It was used to find a lot of bugs in the early days of staking. But since then, it hasn't gotten that much love. And so we recently had Alex Peters um, join us. Alex Peters previously worked at um, Confio um, on the Cosmosm team. So we kept him in Cosmos. He didn't get to leave. And so, and he's been working on revamping the simulator. So in a recent PR, we've uh, he's been working on getting the simulator to work with the Go tool, with the Go test tooling uh, toolkit system. And it's already seen a 10x improvement in speed for simulations. And he's also working on a new API for the simulator. Um, let me just grab everyone a PR for the new API. Oops. And if you have some time over the weekend, I want to just give a read how simulators, how simulations will or could look like in the future. We'd love your feedback. Um, the goal is just to make it simpler. So once we have an approval, a thumbs up from uh, some people, some from you guys, then we'll move forward with it. And then we'll work on a tutorial on how to write simulations. And hopefully it can help everyone avoid issues on mainnet. In doing so, in, in part of the testing story, we've been working on upping our code coverage across the repository and fixing how we do testing and how we do QA. So we have had a continuous auditor for the past couple months. We've been working with AuditorSec in that process. And so every month, they go through um, specific PRs on features that are touching parts of the code base that are um, more sensitive or could lead larger issues. Um, but also past that, they also just can go into the SDK and just sometimes read parts of the code base that we don't send them. And so they found a few bugs and the new features we've been developing. Um, and so we've made sure to fix those, patch those, and make sure they don't get into production. Um, we've also added system tests. So system tests is something that the WASMD Confio team worked on um, with Alex um, at his time there and they do a lot of upgrade testing. And so we managed to get upgrade testing into SDK in a much more seamless fashion. Um, this is also documented. And so if you'd like to do upgrade testing in a non-cross-chain environment, you can do so um, with the new system tests um, feature and testing library. Uh, so where is it documented? It will be in the tests folder. I can grab your link. Thanks. 
Pam, pam, pam. Here you go, a link. Um, and so past that. So as we've talked about in the past couple of months, we've had this accounts module. And this accounts module really enables us to do a lot of things that we couldn't do previously, custom accounts. The custom accounts don't assume how you want to how you want to use replay protection. They don't assume your authentication system. And so in doing so, um, we wanted to migrate some of our current account designs into this new account system. So we've migrated the whole vesting system into the account system, and we've deprecated the creation of vesting accounts in 52 and beyond with the uh, auth module. Now, the reason being is vesting caused a security issue, um, a, not really a security issue, but it caused a mishap that could cause uh, users to swat on addresses. And so, uh, we removed the creation of them because they were actually never meant to be created on a running chain. They were meant as Genesis vesting accounts. And so now you have lockup accounts um, because on the legal, uh, it's a legal misnomer to call the previous vesting accounts vesting. So we renamed them to lockup and those will be used in the accounts. We added an on-chain multi-sig. It's very similar to the uh, Dada design. Uh, Faku worked on that. Um, and so we've added a couple account, different account models there. And we want to, after the Olympus release, we want to start working on uh, ZK accounts with the Celestia team. So we'll be able to implement ZK accounts um, in the accounts model to have, there's a really a lot of cool stuff you can do there. So you can do things like, you can have a native scripting language without having a full VM on chain. And so doing, uh, doing stuff like that could be a lot of fun. Um, and the idea would be to make them stateless and stateful depending on the needs. And so provide some examples and then everyone can go out and have some fun. Past the accounts module, we actually recently um, added the epochs module. So we talked to the Osmosis team. We also designed a simple epochs module and then going around talking to users, everyone was, a lot of people were using the Osmosis design. And so we coordinated with the uh, Osmosis team to upstream their epochs module into the SDK. And so that is landed in the SDK and will be part of the next release. In doing so, we actually also modified the Mint module. So the Mint module um, previously had an inflation function, and that inflation function would allow you to calculate how inflation worked. We modified it and took everything that was in begin block, saying how you calculate how to uh, how much inflation you want to calculate it off the state supply, the total supply, or do you want to calculate it on something completely different? We, we made that into a mint function that can be provided to the mint module. So it's now it's a lot easier to change the token economics of your chain without having to fork the mint module. You can also use the epochs. So the big problem with the mint module is that it is block based, meaning that you as a user need to calculate how many blocks there will be per year based on an assumed block speed. And instead of that, uh, now with epochs, now it's time based. So now you can say how many epochs will there be in a year and that will manage the calculation and be more exact than it was before of course it's optional once you upgrade you'll still have the same functionality as today but you can also migrate to something more um more in tune with what you would like also highly recommend we all drop inflation across the system could be fun to see um that we don't have such high inflation and then the ecosystem has a higher potential of flourishing um the fact we would call me uh, Mille from Argentina. Um, so I got called that in Slack the other day, which is, which is fun. Um, but um, yeah, so lower, lower inflation. Um, then um, some of the other stuff that we also will be doing in the near term and that we're currently working on that is blocking the next release. So one of the features is unordered transactions. So we wanted to make it, we want to make it safe to work with amino signed transactions. Um, also talking with Brendan um, from DYDX, he proposed using time instead of height, um, and because it's a more, uh, it's a better UX for clients instead of having to query the chain for a height and then calculating future block heights. Also, t um, time based in heights we know is a misnomer, um, and so it's always better to just use direct time because this is something humans are more akin to. And so we'll be diving into that. We also want to break cyclical dependencies. So now with modules being in their own Go mods, the Cosmos SDK depends on auth, bank, and staking, and staking, bank, and auth depend on the Cosmos SDK. And the Cosmos SDK depends on them for testing. And so we're working on breaking that cyclical dependency 
so we can have a cleaner dependency graph, not the cleanest, but still cleaner, and then that will allow us to move forward with the next release. We already have an open PR for staking, and we're, it's in review. Um, there's some minor changes that need to happen, um, but we are nearing the completion of that. But in the meantime, we are slowing down features, um, and we aren't. We are trying to avoid adding new features right now in order to prepare for the next release, so we don't have too much bloat. Any questions on anything I just said? Anyone from the SDK team um, want to add anything if I missed it? Awesome, awesome. So what's up with Olympus? Um, this release um, that has been evading us for months. Well, Olympus is near completion. Like I mentioned, we are moving towards feature freeze and towards um, audits and um, QA and testing. In this QA process, we plan on creating uh, more tooling for the for a better QA process and better testing. And so we want to start that in the next two weeks, um, dependent on the cyclical, the testing cyclical dependencies being cleaned up. And so if uh, anything pops up because of that, um, then it may delay the release, uh, may delay the QA, but we're trying to get that done as fast as possible. Um, any questions on anything that is coming in Olympus? So are we still on track uh, for a release uh, in Q2, so this month? We we want to, um, but we just we just need to break the cyclical dependency. So this it's like we will start QA and testing because the cyclical dependency cleanup will not do will not touch logic within the SDK, um, and so we we can break it out, but the final release is dependent on breaking the cyclical dependency. So how do you assess like you know likelihood to have it this month? Uh, you, we will have an alpha and beta and potential RC um, this month, um, but That's the final awesome. release will most likely come in July. That's where okay. thank you. Um, so two features I actually forgot to mention um, that we started we kicked off. Um, we kicked off a off chain in process indexer. So state streaming was the first version of a street of a state indexer with events and everything. But in talking to users and also developing a state streamer ourselves, um, we found that it's actually very hard to use. Um, and it's not very um, it's not very that everyone is using it. And so it's not really can't be done in a decentralized fashion and can't really replace queries within state machine. And so an off-chain in-process indexer will aims to be an uh, indexer that decodes the input, puts it into Postgres, and then you're able to put Superbase or any API on top of the um, on top of the database. It's already decoded and everything, so you can query directly the database instead of querying the node. Um, that's something that we are working on. Um, other part is message v2, but uh, stay tuned next month for updates on message v2. There's an ADR, and basically what it aims to do is take the signer out of the message and put it into a, an envelope next to the message, and this will help speed up the state machine and decrease complexity. Um, awesome, awesome. If no one has any questions, then I can hand over the mic to Huang Yi on Block SDM. Yeah, thanks. And uh, yeah, let me uh, post the link to the yeah. I write a simple markdown for the to outline the the the, the, top, the sharing and the uh, let me also share the screen. Yeah, yeah, you can you can see the screen right. Uh, yes, we can see it. Yes, thanks, thanks. Uh, so uh, recently we uh we have the, we did the implementation of the block STM algorithm to uh do the parallel transaction execution, execute the transactions in parallel and uh, the benchmark numbers are very good actually 
who are surprised. And uh, so for people who are not familiar with this, uh, block STM is an algorithm that proposed by uh, Aptos team, I think in 2022, and they, they write the original paper and the uh, uh, Rust implementation in the blockchain. And uh, Seichen, as, as far as I, I know, that they, they are the first to write a GONA implementation that works with Cosmos SDK. And uh, when we start to evaluate this, we find the uh, Seichen's implementation is uh, deep, highly coupled with their uh, patched Cosmos SDK fork. So that makes this, makes this uh, not uh, very reusable for other or the other uh, blockchain projects. So we try to write a new implementation and try to make it uh, reusable and uh, in integratable with the standard Cosmos SDK. But uh, of course, uh, uh, right now the implementation, we, we still have to uh, do some minimal changes in the our own uh, Cosmos SDK fork, but uh, those changes are minimal and we hope that uh, uh, in the future Cosmos SDK version that we can upstream this stuff. And uh, yeah. And uh, during the development and the profiling, we also identified uh, multiple optimizations in Cosmos SDK that uh, 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 some makes, makes it works better with the parallel execution engine and uh, also other some general optimizations. So here is some uh, benchmark results. This benchmark is uh, very uh, is a specific for uh, for the block delivery flow. Basically, it uh, generates some random blocks and uh, call the finalized block and uh, commit with it. So you can see the uh, this benchmark is run on my laptop and uh, it, you can see the block STM version which is around five times faster than the sequential one. And uh, the case is uh, the, the test block has 5,000 transactions with 100 unique sender accounts. So the situation is quite, I think quite quite conservatively because in real world is maybe has more unique accounts because with less, uh, less unique accounts, you have more interdependent transactions. Uh, so first of all, uh, let's, What's the block STM uh, algorithm? It's an optimistic parallel execution engine that uh, in the in the first round we tried we tried to just simply execute the transactions in parallel, but uh, we will validate the uh, execution results and try to detect the conflicts. If in uh, in the optimal case that there's no conflicts in all the transactions then the parallel execution is done. That's the most optimal case. But when we, uh, if the validation fails, that means there are some conflicts between the transactions and we will re-execute them simply. And uh, the end result are made sure to be identical to a sequential execution. So the uh, good thing about this is this system is the ex execution engine is totally transparent to user. We don't need to add anything fancy into the transaction format or basically it's fully transparent to user. And uh, you can even have in, in the network with some nodes do the traditional sequential execution and some other nodes do the block STM uh, execution, the app hash would be identical. And uh, we just uh, need to, uh, in the application logic, we try to avoid shared states. But of course, there are, uh, for the shared state, we can separate the accidental state sharing with the uh, inherent state sharing. For example, in uh, for, for transactions that are sent from the same sender accounts, inevitably we have to modify 
the balances of the same account that in increase the nonsense of the same account. That is, those sh state sharing we cannot, cannot avoid. But uh, other than that, uh, we should uh, remove all the other accidental sharings. For example, uh, notably in the Cosmos SDK, we, we have this free connection, which is uh, uh, ob obvious case for this. We also find some other cases in Ethermint, which we have to uh, change it. So, uh, so what was the situation with the fee connection? So currently the fee connection works as a normal bank transfer from the fee payer to a global module account. That makes all the transaction logic uh, will touch a shared accounts balance. So our refactoring is to make the uh, fee connection. Uh, we, we introduce a, a concept like a virtual virtual uh, bank sending. So instead of uh, when when you send send some coins to a module account, virtually, uh, it, instead of it immediately increase the recipient's balance, we will accumulate the send in a transient st st store in the transient store and the key is with a transaction index as the prefix so different transactions uh during the execution will not touch the same state but in the end blocker it will accumulate those sendings and uh, uh modify the actual recipient which is a free connector module account Uh, yeah, there are a few other cases in Ethermint uh, that we have to tackle, but that is uh, for another day's topic. Uh, basically, the, the idea is that you have to benchmark to find some uh, these state sharings that can be avoided. But for those uh, application, inherent state sharings inside the application, that is uh, unavoidable. And uh, the other thing we find that uh, related to the uh, parent execution is the catch implementation. Right now, all the, uh, the, the, the for example, the catch KVs, catch KV store, all has a, a mutex to protect the, the LRU catch data structure. And uh, actually, that makes all the transactions will contend for the mutex in read operations. Actually, the write operations is fine because we always buffer the writes in a local uh, catch KV store, right? So write, write operations is actually very good for the parallel transaction execution. And those buffered writes are only committed to into, into the shared store uh, after all the transactions executed. But uh, uh, so we modified a little bit here for the catch KV store. So makes uh, uh, to, to avoid to attend content for a shared mutex into the read operations simply remove the uh, read catch we only keep the uh, write buffers uh so next let me uh briefly introduce the implementation uh of course i guess i uh, i can't mention uh, cover all the details because it's uh, I, I would recommend you guys to read the paper and the implementation because the paper itself is actually pretty uh, well written. It's very detailed. And uh, our Go9 implementation is also actually, the code base is small, it's, it's not large. And uh, yeah, it should be uh, readable, the code itself. Uh, so first of all, for the top level, at the very top level, uh, it has a, a multiple, it is spawns multiple executors. So you can control the concurrency level by controlling the number of execute, executor. Each executor runs a tight loop in the standard non-go routine. And uh, they will 
you can let me let, let, let's look at the code a little bit so it basically it's a fetch the next task and uh, execute it it's a simple uh tight loop and uh, in and uh, there's an important uh, thing here in in the implementation in this multi-version data structure so it uh, records all the versions of the values for for the keys uh, it keeps basically it tracks all the different values uh, written by different transactions for the same key so you can for example, the read operation of this multi-version data structure will tell you that uh, uh, the version of the value for the key that's written by a transaction that that's before the current transaction. That's the value you want to uh, want to read, and uh, you also do some other things like. Uh, uh, detect the dependencies in wrong time. Mm. Yeah, and uh, I think we, we can do, if, if you are interested, we can do uh, deeper explanations here because uh, I think it's, it's, it's hard for me to uh, explain very briefly and uh, but the, the thing about this data structure is i find that uh it can be easily integrated into cosmos sdk because we already have this concept of layers of storage it works very very well for cosmos sdk uh, storage interfaces so we we in our implementation this multi-version data structure is just a multi-store it implements the multi-store interface and we hook hook it into the uh, into the base app execution logic as a layer of multi store, and yeah, and uh, the other thing is this estimate mark. It's an important optimization in block STM, uh, which is which works like this. So in the so when a transaction that is aborted for failed validation, as mentioned before, for each transaction after it's executed, it, the result is also will be validated. Uh, and if if the validation fails, the transaction is scheduled for re-execution. And before is it re-execute is re-executed. It will mark the all the keys that's touched by it with a uh, estimate mark. The purpose of this is so when another transaction read the same key and uh, find its uh, find the estimate mark, it will immediately know that it depends on this transaction, and it will wait for it will block and wait for this transaction to finish. So this is an important optimization that avoid uh, 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 too many transaction re, re abort and re executions. Basically, it means it can detect this dependency at the runtime and block and wait for dependent depending transaction to finish. Uh, yeah, in the end, then uh, I want to share this. Uh, transaction state machine, I think, is critical to understand the, the whole algorithm and the whole flow. And uh, in the beginning, all the transactions are are ready to execute, and uh, then the ex executors, the multiple executors, will try to pick the task from it and uh, execute the transactions in parallel. And uh, then, when Execution when uh, normally most most of the time the transaction will simply uh, execute it fit successfully and uh, enter this executed state uh, and then it will be scheduled for validation and uh, if validation failed it will enter this aborting state 
otherwise, if if the validation is successful, then it it is uh it is kept in this executed states. Uh, in a button state, it will be uh increase its incarnation for for another for another re-execution. The incarnation will increase and uh, will be executed again. And uh, during the executing, as mentioned uh, before, that it could find a estimate mark and will it will suspend itself and enter this suspended state and uh, will wait for the depending transaction to finish and uh, will resume this transaction. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, it. And uh, I think there's something I want to add to the benchmark results is that uh, I think at, at the beginning, our intuition is that if the for this optimistic execution uh, strategy, the worst case scenario, for example, all the transactions in the same block is sent from a same sender account. In that case, all the transactions are basically uh, depend on the previous transactions, right? Because they at least will increase the nonce of the same account. All the transactions will touch some shared state. And that's kind of the worst case scenario. And the in worst case scenario, you would, you would think that the, the performance will be very bad because there, there will be many uh, re-executions. But to our surprise, our benchmark shows that even in that case, the the parallel version is not is still a, a, a little bit faster than the sequential version. Uh, because in in the optimal in the optimal case, there are uh, because those transactions in conflict, they are not uh that, that there is some chance that they still can be optim optimistically executed successfully in parallel there are only some chance they will be scheduled for re-execution if if they got unlucky so so in our i think at least in our benchmark in our implementation it shows that uh, even in the worst case scenario, it's not slower than a sequential execution. So that give, gives us many confidence in the performance of this, this thing. Yeah, that's, that's my sharing. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you for the presentation. Super interesting. Um, Anyone have any questions from the from the SDK side? Uh, you you shared the PRs that you guys made in um, on your SDK fork, and we're already going through it and, and discussing it um, about upstreaming it, and also include including some of the designs in the V two design of bank and uh, store V two, so it can be um, as performant and even more performant. Um, yeah, quick, quick question, I guess, like, so how, how many, that's really awesome. That's really, it's really cool. I'm just like, like, so how often, uh, do you see transactions needing to be re-executed? Um, do you have any numbers on that? Uh, you mean, uh, in what, what case, like in this benchmark? Yeah, in the benchmark, because like uh, from what I gather, it's like if there's contention between transactions, you re-execute them and the contention is due to concurrency. So like there's some loss of doing double work, but it's still faster. I guess I'm curious, like like what the tipping point is for re-execution, like like of the of the five thousand transactions in this test, like how many actually got requeued for re-execution? Uh. You you mean in the worst case scenario that I mentioned? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. like worst case. I need to uh, recheck it. I, I don't have numbers in my head right now. 
but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it do has a matrix inside the library that uh, it can print the number of re-executions. Uh, but uh, yeah, right right now I don't have that in 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 my head. I only remember the the end uh, result for the timing for for the for the execution. Cool. And when it's doing the execution, does it do everything in the block as a first pass, or does it, do the workers like work on a priority queue where they can sort of like if you have five thousand transactions, right? I would imagine maybe if there's a uh, contention in the first few transactions. Ideally, you would recognize that and then re enqueue the the conflicting transaction sort of at the head of the priority queue. So you have like a priority queue of everything of all the transactions in the block, rather than you know having your workers go over all five thousand transactions. They they can like pick up the the first transactions first to like prevent. Um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's critical that the scheduling is always prioritize the transactions with lower transaction index. The transaction index itself is a uh, function as the version of in 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 this thing. And uh, it always prioritizes the lower index. And uh, it don't has a physical queen for it. It's just uh, keeping track of some of the indexes. It's like you, ha you have an array of all the transaction tra transaction bodies and uh, you have index into those uh, into this array, and you just it just keep track of the current indexes. Awesome, awesome. Seems like all everyone who had questions might follow up in in um, Slack or possibly reach out directly. Um, I'll post the I'll post the chat. Uh, I'll post the link to the block SDM repo. Um, if you didn't already grab it, and then you can take a look. And I believe uh, Huangi as well is in the Cosmos Tech channel, so you can reach out to him there directly as well. Um, that's it from everyone. Just want to double check if anyone has any questions for the SDK team or anyone else on this call um, before we close it off. Awesome. Then see you in a month's time. In the meantime, if you need us, you can reach out via Slack, Discord, or Telegram or, and or email. So just reach out if you need any help, have any questions, and we're happy to assist. Thank you, guys. Ciao, ciao.